All right, welcome back to another episode of the SARP Junkies podcast. Uh, before we begin, if you could like, subscribe, and share from wherever you are listening, that would help us out a lot. Uh, my name is Matthew Ward, and I am on the SARP Junkie team. Uh, today, I have my co-host, Jeff Amrine, with me. How are you doing today, Jeff? Doing great. Good, good. And today, we have with us Raul Hernandez. Uh, Raul is a business strategist, coach, and consultant. He has trained hundreds of entrepreneurs, played a key part in helping scale businesses, and has overseen hundreds of online advertising campaigns. Uh, he is also an author, blogger, and podcast host. Uh, in addition to his own insight, Raul interviews leading voices on the hashtag Do Good Work podcast, a podcast which highlights the drive within founders and organizations to achieve excellence and create an impact within their work. Um, within this podcast, they seek to provide actionable takeaways for the audience and has featured leaders who have worked with not noticeable brands such as Quicksilver, Walmart, Bank of America, and others. Um, and it also caters to entrepreneurs, startups, and small business owners who are making an impact in their business and community. Raul, thanks for coming on, man. Welcome, man. Sorry for having you read that long, <laughs> long intro there. <laughs> we had to make sure to hit all the points, man. But to man, do... I didn't know how much you were going to go, but I love it. <laughs> You've done a bunch of stuff, but but give it. Tell us a little bit about your about your journey. You're obviously very accomplished, but give us kind of the the rundown. Well, the rundown started where I didn't know if I was going to go into business. I actually wanted to go into animation with DreamWorks and um, DreamWorks or Pixar. And I remember using AOL, if you guys remember those emails back in the day, to message uh, a director in um, or an, a marketing director or a team director or an animation director at, I think it was DreamWorks, to get tips in high school. Um, but then I came across what students were doing here in San Diego when it comes to building companies that actually made a difference. Uh, one of those was Solo Hour back in the day where they were selling eyeglasses or sunglasses, but they actually gave around 10%, I think, back to funding cataract surgery. And I, for me, getting exposure to that was pretty cool. Um, but I dug deeper and I got into like an entrepreneurship program, like 12 kids out of the School of Business at SDSU. From there, learning how to paddleboard with a co-founder of Volcom, being in the same room with uh, Taylor Guitar's founder, being able to have like Ralph Rubio come speak and stuff like that. So it's getting exposure to that this is a path in life and that we can actually create not only just value, but a, almost anything that you'd, you'd want to create. I saw that as an ultimate path of creativity. And obviously there has to be product market fit and all that fun stuff that comes with that. But that's pretty much the story in uh, 30 seconds. Great. And, and how'd you, I mean, you've, you've done a variety of things. You've, you've got the, the, the podcast of your own that do good work and you've, you've written a book. Of all that mix of activity, what's your favorite how do you like to spend your time the most? I love spending my time and actually written this down. So that's a great question. I love spending my time connecting with really interesting entrepreneurs on the podcast, or even if entrepreneurs who are looking to get support, like when I have conversations, but connecting with a cool and awesome entrepreneur, either starting or, you know, had this seasoned. And then from there, focusing on solving problems within the organizations that I support or see on the back end of um, that to me is, is fun. And I know that's, Sometimes uh, more people mean more engagement or walk into an office, but I really love that, that rhythm. When you're working with some of these entrepreneurs, what would you say are some of the overarching themes that they faced um, that are large challenges for them? So the way that I work, it's, um, it's like a three pronged effect of focusing on ensuring that we're designing the right things within the business, ensuring that those things are being executed. But the last tier, and this is, I think, universal and actually just got off a podcast with a uh, with the young lady over at LinkedIn, and she sees this as well in her, in her departments with all of the experience that she's had. It's always working and managing with others, teams, management, leadership. And I think that is more of an art and it's being more president now or president now as we start, you know, remote flex, the future of work, the future of engagement, the future of team morale, culture being more of a, of a standard as opposed to some companies may make you feel like uh, you can't speak up, you can't share your ideas, or how do I work through you know, different scenarios? Because the thing about business is sometimes it can be very binary. It's either works or it doesn't. It's a, it's a balance sheet, it's a finance, it's a product market fit. But when you work with like organic matter with humans, it's a variable, you don't know what you're gonna get. It, 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 those thoughts are captured in, in the book. Talk a little bit about the book you wrote. And, and, and I'd be real interested from a recent 
author standpoint, we just put a book out as well called Creating Startup Junkies. It talks about creating venture ecosystems in unexpected places. That was a big hurdle for me. Always been a bucket list item. Had I not had a co-author and a business partner that had done it a few times before, I'm not sure I would have gotten it done. So how'd you, how'd you get pushed through that and actually get the book created and pushed out? I think the book was written a year before I decided to write it. So it was already like in different, I, want, I don't want to say manuscripts, but notes from different implementations, from talks, from trainings, from working with uh, like with clients, like, hey, this would really help. We should do this. Or, hey, this actually worked. Let's put this in. Um, and what I use, and like I'm not tool dropping, but I just use Google Google Drive, and then I just spoke it to life. So I just gave the presentation in my office to Google, and from there it just transcribes my voice, and then from there I, the editing process begins. But that's how I was able to do that faster than typing away and trying to figure out what should I put on a page. Like, what would someone on the other side benefit from listening to it? What's the sequential order that would make more sense? <clears throat> But if I were to do it again, I'd have different formatting options, but uh, that's how I went about it. Very cool. I mean, that's, that sounds like a clever way, a clever way to, to get through that typical kind of writer's block that you get into when you're sitting in front of the screen and you're trying to compose something. Very clever way to do it. What, what, would, what would a reader get out of the book? What are kind of the, the key points that someone that's consuming the material would take away? It, depending on the, the way that they're consuming it for audiobook, there is deliberate action items that you can I pause and tell you what to do. For the actual physical book, there are sections I, I deliberately made it a, a different size and a feel so that you can have notes on the left and the right hand columns of the, the pages. So not only can you take notes, but I think that it's important to understand the life cycle of getting clarity within what kind of business you're growing or you want to grow. So that includes design. So I put in a lot of design elements to make sure what are we actually building for so that when you don't go six months, a year, a year and a half down the line, you're actually building towards that end goal as opposed to working the other way around. So that first section is just getting really clear. We go through some simple exercises that are some soft, quote unquote, soft skills and others around, hey, what's your actual numbers in the business? Just getting real good pulse. From there, it's moving it into Let's actually build out the infrastructure strategically based on what you told us in the beginning of the book. Like, these are the things that are important. This is how we're going to look at our business in a very holistic point of view, but not redundant, but just like a big uh, three-pronged approach within the business. So your operations, your marketing, your product, everything falls under those three. And then building essential assets within each. And then the final, like the capstone chapters are around leadership and synchronizing everything so that you can maintain momentum and not just do it once, but it continually improve upon what you got. When, when you were in the process of creating that book, I know you said it was a pretty smooth. Um, not smooth. <laughs> it sounds it, smooth, but it was definitely a lot. It's a labor of love. Yeah. So, so on that, was there any set portion that challenged you the most? Like in when writing it or in the actual sections of the book? I was saying in the writing. I would say you can edit this piece out, but I know that uh, for the pause, but I think that the, uh, it wasn't as challenging because everything I draw upon is either real life experience that worked, ex implementations or tactics that are actually proven. And none of it was more fluffer, like ideas like, hey, this might work, this is nothing was theory. The only thing is that you don't know what the reader, is, where the reader's at in their journey. So it's very difficult to kind of create a cookie cutter solution, which I'm not trying to do, but create a framework, which is adaptable depending on where you're at. Now, of course, the book is written geared towards if you already have some momentum in your business and you're growing, you have some, like you're trying to get to the next leverage point. So that's the, the goal in mind. But that was, I think the biggest challenge is how do I frame it? So depending if you're, you know, starting off and you're about to hire your fifth person or you're at your 20th person, you want to get to 25. So that was kind of the bigger challenge of looking at it from that framework stance. Let's shift gears on you a little bit. You, you've got, you've obviously worked with a lot of startups in early stage, but you've got some pretty amazing large enterprise clients as well. What's, contrast the, the difference in working with something that's very early stage versus working with the large enterprise. With the enterprise clients, I 
I'm not sure where you got where I'm working with them. I have supported those who work with them. Um, the largest client that I've had has around a hundred, close to a hundred uh, team members. So it's it's day and night from those to like the solopreneurs. But I'm trying to di- dig into a little deeper. For no, them. that's fine. That's fine. That, that's probably an error on the part of the guy reading your bio <laughs> rather than. <laughs> well, I've had a lot of enterprise, like uh, people who work with enterprise clients in the podcast. Well, talk, talk a little bit about how you buy. So, so let's switch the question a little bit. When you're working with a, a B2C versus a B2B mm-hmm. uh, early stage company, how, how do you change the advice and the guidance that you give? How are those, those different in terms of how you guide them? I think the most important piece is um, focusing on what the actual velocity of implementation is. I know for the smaller folks or for smaller companies, uh, if you're a team of two, a team of five or a small, your implementation is going to be much slower. So it's making sure that we're actually taking action upon what's being delivered um, simply because there is the two pieces, there's the strategy, but then there's the implementation. And if you're a small team, you're typically doing all the implementation. And some weeks it may not make sense to quote unquote build. And that's the difficult piece. And I allude to that in the book where that the train is going, but you're building the train tracks as well. And the train doesn't stop. In my view, the train shouldn't stop because that's your business, that's momentum. But that is can be very difficult where those are longer hours where you're having to, you know, do the work that you need to do, but then also start building the future at the same time. That makes sense. That makes sense. You're in such a vibrant uh, startup scene out there, in San Diego, Southern California, and obviously the Valley. Do you, do you engage with, or do you find some of your clients through engagements you might have through accelerators, incubators, venture studios? How do the clients typically come to you? Thankfully, a lot of them have been through referral. So it's from doing great work with one client and then they speak to others. Uh, with San Diego, I just love being able to have that connection, even just like having a small mastermind here with a buddy of mine. And we're really woven and interconnected. So introductions are always happening that way. So it's I really like the fact that San Diego has been transitioned to more of a tech hub, even though it's like a hidden fifth place behind the top five or top four. Well, and you got the weather that beats everybody else that's on that list. It's hard to beat 70 miles of like beach. So <laughs> no doubt about it. Where, where do you want to take the business? So, so you've got this pretty good following, it's a strong practice and published author. And where do you see it going in the next three to five years? That's a great question. One of my goals are to continue to build the the audience and nurture that to create real value. I've seen like people who've gone just taken the book itself and have gone great ideas and implementations from that. One of the things that I'm looking to do is create an annual program. And it's not like a like a coaching program. It's more like here's the actual material, here's how you implement it and getting you support for a year. And from there, making sure that you graduate. Cause I know that for some, if you're super quick to implement. You can do all this work within a month, two months, but if you're larger or you're smaller, you definitely need more support to be able to do, um, to implement the infrastructure, to implement the trainings, to make sure that the team is on par. And then also taking cycle time to make sure that what you've implemented, you're seeing and bearing the fruits of, and you may not see those fruits within the first 30 days. You might see those 60, 90, 180 days. So that's one of my goals to be able to do that and be able to help and support others asynchronously so I don't have to be on a one-on-one conversation and being able to do that one to many. Raul, something I'd be, I'd be curious to hear about is with all this time and effort that you put into everything you've done to get to where you are now, what would you say is your why, the catalyst behind you waking up and doing what you do? That's a great question. I just love to create. And if you read the, uh, for the podcast, like the, the hidden beauty behind excellence, that hidden beauty drives me a lot. Like no one sees that effort that you did that sweat that you're expounding. Let's say if you work at a 5 a.m. or you're waking up at 3 a.m. No one sees that. No one has the Instagram photos. I mean, they might, but that (laughs) drive, that that precision, when you talk to someone around that, you can feel it. And there's a there's a level of respect around that. Yeah, I agree with that. Whether it's a sport or if you're an artist, whatever, they see the output, but they don't see the time and the effort it took to really get to that. And when you talk to someone who has done that, you can really feel that energy and uh, the time they put into it as well. It's kind of that connection. And I, I definitely see what you're, you're talking about there. And it encourages each other to grow. 
you know, when you're running a, a, a people oriented business, a, a consultancy, an agency, however you'd want to characterize it, figuring out how to scale that is critically important. It sounds like you're, you're thinking about how you can do the one to many through using the tools and whatnot. The question is, as you're building this now, how do you, what do you do for fun? How do you pull yourself out of it occasionally so you can recharge and, and kind of be energized for that next client that comes along? Oh, that's a great question. I recently got a golden retriever puppy, so she definitely keeps me <laughs> entertained. Uh, I try to surf as often as I can. I ride my, my bicycle uh, as much as I can. 20, 30 miles is still a struggle for me. So we'll try to get to that 50, 60 mile mark. Um, so just getting outdoors, thankfully, that's, I think, a huge benefit to location or wherever you're at, just taking walks uh, with the wife or taking hikes as often as you can. So it's just being able to get out and even sometimes quarterly or hopefully now as often as we can go to the mountains where now I don't have Wi-Fi reception and I can really unplug. Completely disconnect right? To get, to get that, that recharge. And it's so important because, you know, you strike me as the kind of person that really loves what you do. And sometimes that can be consuming to the extent oh, yeah. that it can, it can, you can become one dimensional, you know, it can block out everything else. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. People say, what, what about work-life balance? And I tell them, and when you're in a startup or when you're creating your own venture or running your own agency, there's no balance. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a sine wave. You, you're going to be sprinting really hard at some points, and then you got to take a time out. But what are you, what are your thoughts on some of that? Is there work life balance from what you've seen? You know, I think in the corporate, uh, like again for larger organizations or bigger bigger um, corporations, there might be some sort of emphasis of trying to balance that out. With well, once you check out from work, don't check email or whatever. But I think for entrepreneurs who are who are actually pushing and are actually trying to do it, like I actually was helping a client this morning with an 80-20 day optimization to look at his day and making sure, hey, are you focusing on your high leverage tasks? What are, is your team doing? How are you getting support? Are you should you be on these meetings? Um, and he's definitely in that in that hustle grind where he's coming in at 8:30 and he sometimes finishes at seven. And I know that that can be very difficult. And I know for me that I've had to do that. Where in the beginning to start this thing, I was waking up at 2, 3 a.m you know, making things work. And, and it's definitely a season, I would like to put it. I don't think there is such a thing as a work-life balance because you got one life and your brain works all the time. That's the beauty of the way that our, our mind has infinite capacity for infinite knowledge, which is amazing. Will it fill up with infinite? I'm not sure, but I know that we are always thinking we're always, you know, trying to figure out what we want to do. So it's important to have triggers in your day to know if if I'm shutting the computer off at six o'clock or seven o'clock, then now I can actually focus on, you know, my my day to day activities or the things that are important for family, for health. Um, so there is no balance, but I think that you can you can actually create harmony between both. To looking at what are the essential blocks that I like to focus on for my life that are key the key habits. And I discussed this in the book as well, because there, there are key habits for founders and then there's key habits for your teams and making sure that we, you know, we, we optimize those, but also we live those out. Um, so the, making sure that you understand what are the key habits that are essential for your well-being, um, your family community's well-being, as well as for the business. And then focusing on those and then not getting overburdened with, you know, time structures or just trying to separate things, just let it happen and continue to optimize those ebbs and flows as you go. Super great advice. I'm going to, I, I will, this is the one uh, question that might be kind of a little off the wall, but it's been sort of a thing we've been pondering in our own office. So you see Clubhouse is rolled out, right? As this mm -hmm. audio chat platform. And we're all trying to figure out uh, where's this going to fit in the scheme of the way we engage and obviously the pandemic's changed lots of different things, but you have any thoughts about that? I mean, you seem like somebody that thinks deeply about design and various different platforms that are out there. What's your take? What, what is Clubhouse going to end up being? That's a great question. I think that a lot of the larger techs are going to try to copy Clubhouse. I know I think Twitter released something yesterday of this recording, like for communities and like a Patreon type deal. With Clubhouse, I think if you have an audience and you want to engage them in real time, it's like an open Zoom room for everyone to come in and engage. I think there is value in that because we're finding it that 
people's voices need to want to be heard and they don't want, they want to be able to have transparency across, you know, the mic across the screen. Now, when it comes to like, I've also recently read that I think Mark Cuban is investing a fireside chat, a clubhouse esque type app. So there is something here with community engagement, but if you're looking at this in your business, like, Oh, not another marketing channel to add on. I think it's very important to be able to see what are my consumers want? What do my clients care about? And how am I owning the feed? What am I actually creating that I actually own? If not, I'm the product. And if I'm the product and I don't own it, then we have to question like, what is this actually for? And is this beneficial for my audience at the end of the day? Uh, that's good advice. And it's, and it's something we've been scratching our head, heads with. You know, a, a lot of groups like ours went through this pretty substantial digital transformation. Classically, we put on 250 or 300 live events a year to try to engage the entrepreneurs and whatnot. The pandemic happens and all that ends. And so quickly that's all got to become digital and online. And mm -hmm. there was some good residual that came out of that, but it was a, it was a mind shift change where we realized we're not going to have that. You know, we used to joke about the events and we probably totally stole this from Google was you got to be intentional about planned uh, creative collisions, right. And having, people that didn't know they needed to know each other together. Well, all that kind of evaporates when you're in a digital format where it's a Zoom room or it's some other kind of platform. So it's, it's interesting. And I think the way you, you couch that on, on uh, Clubhouse is important because just the fact that it's something else out there, trying to figure out the business value and where it fits is, is the real challenge. Yeah, and I think there there are some again doing research on this, and and I appreciate the the compliment. I think if you're studying what your audience thinks, Clubhouse, you're hearing it from their mouth. There's focus groups for very specific niches, and if you're serving that industry, that niche, to be able to listen to exactly the tonality, what they think, and how they say it, without doing focus groups. That could be a really good goldmine to use it, not for a marketing, but for research. Interesting. Well, with everything that you're involved with, if you had a crystal ball and you could look into it and see what success looks like for you personally, what do you think that looks like? It's a great question. I think for success, it's always relative, right? So it's quality of life. I don't know. I think, thankfully, I think I'm there. I think I'm being able, I'm thrilled to be able to work with clients. I would I'd love to continue to figure out uh, and tinker. How can I grow the audience? How can I add more, create more impact? And I think that's just continuing down this path. And if that crystal ball can give us two or three hours extra per day, it would be a, would be a, <laughs> would be that. Well, one of the ways we like to land the plane when we have these conversations is, well, well if you could roll the clock back, however many years, five, six, seven years back, and you could take the wisdom you have now and give your younger self some advice, what would those pieces of advice be? Oh, get on LinkedIn and connect with every single person, build real relationships, read five, minimum of five to eight books a month. That's great. That's great. And you got any favorite books you're reading right now? I, let me pull up my Audible. <laughs> I think I was just finishing one with... Um, What's his name? Zig Ziglar. So I'm appreciating Zig's work. So that's always a good classic to go back to. Um, but I was just always reading what's relevant to the problems that you're looking to solve. That's what I found is uh, beneficial for my education. Well, that's great. Thanks for coming on. But before we go, how can the audience find out more about what you're doing, how they could engage with you, et cetera? What's the best way for them to find you? Appreciate you having me on. Uh, the best place is just the website, dogoodwork.io. You'll be able to link out to all the different channels, et cetera, from there. But uh, if you have anything, you can also email me directly all on the website. Perfect. Raul, thanks so much for coming on. It was great chatting. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take it easy.